I don't believe truer words have ever been spoken without you, Lord. I can't even make it. We live and move and have our very being in the God of heaven. And we thank him so much for richly blessing us this morning uh, to come out to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. We want you to keep Brother Hayward in prayer. He is in uh, Florida this morning uh, preaching the gospel down in uh, Fort Lauderdale. And he will leave there. And from my understanding, he will go to the Southeast Lectureship to speak Wednesday night. So we want to keep him uplifted in prayer. We know that we have a traveling minister, a man of God that will fly all around this country trying to proclaim the word of God. So we want to keep him uplifted, keep him uh, uh, supported, because we know it wasn't too long ago he wasn't feeling too well. So we want to make sure he doesn't run himself ragged like he did before. So we want to make sure of that. We want to thank all of you, especially our visitors, uh, we want you to know that a welcome hand is extended here at the West End Church of Christ. And if this is your first time, we, we are a Bible-believing church that is not afraid to speak where the Bible speaks and stay silent where the Bible is silent. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we offer the opportunity to ask questions, not just of myself, but any member here. So we don't want you to leave out here confused or frustrated because you've heard something that you didn't agree with. I would rather get an answer than leave out here and say, well, at least uh, they told me why they believe what they believe. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we'll be uh, as concise as I can be this morning. We want to turn to the book of Colossians, and we're going to be reading from chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Again, that is the book of Colossians. The verses are 1 through 8. Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. For I would that you know what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knitted together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man beguile you with enticing words, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joy and beholding your order, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For the grass wither and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God will stand forever. It was about two months ago, I believe, uh, that I was feeling really bad. I think I was having some sinus headaches and um, some shortness of breath. And as most men, we really hate to go to the doctor. Uh, it's just something about the doctor's office that most men do not like. And I'm one of those men. But one of the things I think I really hate more than going to the doctor is the wait. Um, because, see, I had an 845 appointment, and the doctor didn't see me till a quarter to 10. 
And the first thing they like to do is take your blood pressure. <laughs> so you can imagine, I was a little upset, and my, probably my blood pressure reading wasn't as accurate as it should have been. But what the nurse practitioner did before the doctor arrived was that uh, she took my blood pressure, and then she even gave me an EKG. Uh, and then she took some blood samples from me. She also took some urine samples from me. And she also put me through other tests. Um, because every now and then, you may not see something uh, that you're going through on the surface. And the doctors must take you through rigors of tests to see. But once she finished with me, the doctor came in and the doctor basically asked me a series of questions. Uh, was I eating right? Uh, had I been taking any over-the-counter medicine? Uh, these were questions to probe and to see what symptoms I had. And, and brothers and sisters, I'm here to suggest to you this morning uh, that we all need to go see the doctor every now and then. We all need to get beneath the surface issues. Uh, recently, the government came to a halt over something called Obamacare. Uh, whether you stand pro or con, one thing is undeniable. Every single person should receive medical care. Uh, whether you believe what the Republicans are telling you or whether you believe what the Democrats are saying. I believe it's just good to have a checkup. And with this in mind, I want you to look with me this morning at a book called the Book of Colossians. And this is going to be an examination of a church, a church that is being inundated with something uh, that's false. But because Paul sees this encroachment. He wants to ask the question, uh, are you still faithful? This morning, for just a few moments, I want to entitle this sermon, Obamacare for the Soul. <laughs> Obamacare for the Soul. What we're going to explore this morning is a church that is dealing with knowing the truth, the gospel, but they are being taught false teachings by some brethren. And then we're going to see uh, how this is dealt with. The background of the book of Colossians is a very fascinating one because the city of Colossae at this time, uh, during Paul's writing, was a city about 100 miles east of Ephesus. Colossae was a major city for trade. It was located in the Lycus Valley region. This city was once a thriving metropolis, but at the time of this missive, a rather unimportant city whose prominence had been replaced by neighboring Laodicea and Hierapolis. Paul writes to this particular congregation, but he's never physically been there. But he is admonishing them and their minister, Epaphras, whom he calls his servant or his a fellow slave. Now this affectionate greeting belies the serious matter or the serious nature of this letter. You see, heresy was encroaching this church. And the things that they previously learned is now coming into question. Men are using persuasive argumentation uh, to shipwreck the faith of some. And they sound good, y'all. Uh, the words they speak sound good. If it's said that the book of Ephesians can be called or summarized as the Church of Christ, I believe the book of Colossae can be summarized as the Christ of the Church. You see, this book has a high Christo Christological perspective. In other words, this is a focus on Jesus Christ as the head of the Church. As we see, we're going to look at three things and the lesson will be yours. The first thing is we're going to see the comfort of the church. Then we're going to see the caution to the church. 
And lastly, we're going to see the conclusion of the matter. The comfort to the church, the caution to the church, and then the conclusion of the matter. In chapter 1 of Colossians chapter 1 verse 3, Paul continually prays for this congregation because of their faith based in hope. You see, hope, brothers and sisters, is not wishful expectation. Let me change your idea of what the word hope means. The word hope means expectation. It means that you are expecting something that was promised to you. In verse number 6, Paul then says this hope was previously obtained through preaching. I want you to note that. This hope was previously obtained through preaching. Now you may ask yourself, why is that important, preacher? Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of Almighty God. So if you are hearing something, but it is not mingled with faith, or the thing that you heard is false, then your faith will be false. Many people in this world today have faith in God. Many people in this world today believe in God, but they have a wrong idea of the type of faith that will save them. Some people don't even believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but they have faith. So what we want to examine today is what type of faith does one need to have in order to be saved? Verse number seven says they are now faithful. They are full of faith. They've been preached to by Epaphras. They've been written to by Paul. And Paul says Epaphras is a fellow servant. He is a solid gospel preacher. But just like in the churches today, you have people that will mingle truth with error. You have people that will come in uh, unbeknownst and say things like, well, listen, uh, I think we've outgrown that old time gospel. It's time to put in some, some sisters as elders. It's time to, to add some instrumentality uh, to the worship service because we're losing too many young folk. Uh, it, it's time, brethren, that we stop all these five items of worship. It's time to graduate to something more powerful. Because we want to win the world, don't we? This is the kind of stuff they had to deal with in Colossae. They were dealing with asceticism. They were dealing with mysticism. And they were dealing with uh, something known as Gnosticism. The belief that evil is everywhere. When you breathe in and out, you are breathing in evil. That's, that's Gnosticism. Gnostic thinking uh, was that everything, flesh, could not be pure. That's why they didn't believe Jesus Christ uh, was Lord and Savior. Because they said this man was born of a woman. How can he be Lord and Savior? He ain't nothing special about him. He's a carpenter's son. So they did not believe. But this is the type of teaching that was going on in Colossae. And brothers and sisters, let me let you know, it ain't just in Colossae. In the body of Christ today, we have so many churches of Christ that are leaving the faith because the old time gospel is not good enough. Uh, people are looking for something to stir their souls. Something to clap their hands and stump their feet to. You know, we are so wrapped up in entertainment in the body of Christ today. You'll have 500 people come to a sing out. And you can't get 50 of the same people to come back for a gospel meeting. The word of God is quick and powerful. Sharpening it into his sword. And it will discern your thoughts and your intents. And brothers and sisters, if we don't get back to the old path, God help us because we're going to be in uh, for a long ride. Verse number nine, Paul says prayer is also made so that the saints might be filled with knowledge and wisdom. Look at what he says. He says that the saints may be filled with knowledge and wisdom. Now people say, well what's the difference? I thought knowledge and wisdom were one and the same. No. Knowledge is the understanding. Wisdom is the application. So you remember back in the day when Solomon uh, had two women come to him and say, listen, uh, that baby is hers, not mine. The dead baby is hers and the live baby is mine. And, and they went back and forth. And he said, let me have a sword. He took the sword and he was about to cut the child in half. But the mother said, no, let her have it. Solomon said, she's the real mother. 
See, Solomon was, 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 he had knowledge, but then he had to apply the knowledge. And some of us, we don't have knowledge, and we have a little wisdom, or we have some wisdom, and we ain't got a whole lot of knowledge. But Paul here says, I'm praying that they be faithful, and that they be filled with both knowledge and wisdom. And then in verse 13, he says, God, who have delivered us from the power of darkness, and have translated us into the kingdom of of his dear son. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something that you can stand up on your feet and clap if you want to. You used to be in the kingdom of darkness. You used to be a slave. I know some of y'all ain't never been a slave. Ain't gonna never be a slave. You were a slave. I was a slave. We all were slaves of sin. And the master told us to do something, we did it. Master say, stay at the house at 3 o'clock and see what happened. We sure enough did it. Master say, listen, the club don't close at 5. We sure enough listen. The master said, look, look, this stuff is good for your glaucoma. We sure enough listen, didn't we? We listen because we were slaves. We were slaves in the kingdom of darkness. But then the Bible says Jesus came with the keys to the lock. And he unlocked the shackles that had us bound for so many years. And then he translated us. That's a powerful word. In the Greek, it literally means to move one people from one community to another. You see, in wartime, what they would do is they would win the battle. And they would take the people. And they would take them captive back to their kingdom. What, the Jesus, what Jesus did was basically say, I'm going to die for you, shed my blood, I'm going to take you with me back to my community. Now you're in my kingdom, not the kingdom of Satan anymore. But you know, like us, some of us like to go back every now and then. We like prison food, you know. We like, oh man, you know, hot, hot meals and, you know, ain't got no job. Yeah, I, I stay in jail. You got people that think like that. And brothers and sisters, you know, we have people, even as African Americans, uh, that have slave mentalities. Some of us don't even trust one another. I can see a brother seeing me need. I say, brother, you know, I give some money. Next thing he know, he might come and knock me upside my head and take the rest of it. <laughs> I'm trying to help you, bro. Why, why are you trying to hurt me? Slave mentality. We don't want to help one another. You know why? Because even though we're not slaves, the mental shack shackles of slavery are still on our hands. The same thing happens here. These people have been moved from one kingdom to another. And this is what Paul is referring to. Then in verse 21, he states that we were sometimes alienated. We were sometimes alienated. You know what that word literally means? God didn't have anything to do with us. We were sitting here praying to God. Giving as we prosper, some of y'all tithing, you know, whatever we want to do, spiritually speaking, we tried to reach God, but God was like this, I don't, I don't know you, I don't know you, get away from me. And it sounds cruel to hear God talk like that, but not only were we alienated, the text says that we were enemies of God. It's one thing to be alienated, but it's another thing to be an enemy of God. I got some enemies, but one enemy I don't want is God. And so the Bible says in verse 23, or 21 rather, that we were enemies of God at one time. Now, God had to do something to take us from enemy to friend. What did he do? Well, he gave us the gospel. Look at what he says in verse 23. He says, if, conditional phrase, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Paul says, listen, there's a way that you don't have to go back to the old kingdom. If you want to know how to be saved, stand still. Be steadfast. Stop looking for something new coming down the pike. Stop always talking about, well, this church don't get me excited like it used to. I'm going to so-and-so. I'm going to Word of Faith. I'm going to Big Bethel. I'm go Listen, 
you ain't going to find nothing there. Because this is the only place that Jesus Christ shed his blood, his blood for. And if you want to get some, some new gospel, you ain't going to find it here. Because God said what he said, and he meant what he meant when he said it. The Lord's church is gravitating away from the word of God. We're getting so high-minded. We're getting so, so highfalutin that we're outsmarting the word of God. I've got preacher friends that don't even believe their, their acts of worship anymore. People telling me, man, I don't even know why y'all, man, we free to do what we want to do. But that's because they want something new. And let me tell you this, truth never changes. The only time truth changes is when it becomes a lie. Chapter 2 is where we want to start. Verse 1 says, For I would that you know what great conflict I have for you. He's giving us his comfort. Paul says, listen, I know you're struggling. I haven't been there, but I know that you're trying to stay with the one faith that was taught to you. And I know that there are brethren who want to tell you something different. I know there are some different doctrines floating around in the church of Christ right now. He says, but listen, stay faithful. Stay faithful. He says later on in verse number four, he says, don't let men beguile you. Don't let men take advantage of you. That word beguile literally means to, to cheat you. It means to deceive you by false reasoning. It means to give you a word that's not right. This is what they were doing. This was done through the instrumentality of enticing words. You got preachers today that know how to show enough saying. They can preach a sermon, they can, they can preach the paint off the walls, but they just lying through the teeth. Let's just be real. They're not in it for you, they're in it for them. And we're making millionaires out of false teachers. And the people that want to teach you the truth, you don't want to listen to them. Because it don't sound good. Doesn't make my ears itch. Yeah, yeah, I'm tired of hearing that old saying, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Tired of hearing that. Oh, here's something else. Grab it and grab it. Name it and claim it. That's what I want to hear. That's, 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 what, that's what we want to hear. Because you know what? We, we are so wrapped up in humanism. See, to be a Christian, it means you got to sacrifice. You can't always get what you want when you want it. You have to be focused in. You've got to be locked. You've got to understand that whatever happens, if I lose my job, praise God. If I lose my family member, praise God. If I lose my life, praise God. Revelation chapter 2. I believe it is chapter 2. It says, if we're faithful unto death, he will give us a crown of life. Now we read that a little differently. We translate it in our heads. What we say is, if we stay faithful until death, God will give us. No, no, he didn't say until death. He said unto death. There's a difference. What's the difference, preacher? The difference is this. The word unto means if it means your life. See, some, some of us, we ain't going to give our life. We, uh -uh. We, we change religions when we do that. No, sir. No, sir. But God said, you got to love me to the degree that you're willing to lay down your life. Now, I don't believe in Islam. No disrespect to the Islamists. I don't believe that's the true religion, and I'll, and I'll preach against it. But one thing I do admire about Islamists is that they believe what they believe. Some of them believe it to the degree that they'll kill themselves just to prove it. That's why when I'm on an airplane, I don't want to hear no Quran quote. I don't want to hear no Allah Akbar. I don't want to hear none of that. I got faith, but I'm getting off that plane. But the point is, they are willing to die. They are willing to die for what they believe. But you take the average Christian. Lord, I got a two-figure. I got to lead a church. Oh, Lord. 
Lord, I got an ingrown toenail. I'm going to leave the church. That woman, she, she's talking about me behind my back. I'm not going there no more. Oh, Lord, they, she ain't waving me today. I guess I'm going to Boulder Crest. <laughs> I mean, we give up on any little old thing. God don't need weak need Christians. We're going to be offended, brothers and sisters. And I'm not saying offense should be given, but I'm just saying we're going to be offended as children of God. Just get ready for it. Paul said over there in Philippians, I believe, chapter 1 or chapter 2, he said, he said, listen, some preach for contention. He said, some preach to increase my bonds. But I'm just glad that the word of God is preached. You know, people say, well, I'm not going to that church. I got a bunch of hypocrites over there. I, I know so some. I know she cussed like a sailor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. So yeah, she drank like a fish. I know. I know her. She go to your church. I seen her. She poured me a glass. I know. Yeah, yeah. You know? Then you catch her, you know, she go, oh, Brother Clark, that's, that's water. I said, sister, that's not water. That's, that smells like wine. You know, she said, so water and wine, the miracle doesn't happen again. I said, no, my sister, that's, that was wine when it started. I know that's the that's not but point is, brothers and sisters, I'm being humorous, but I want to say that, that we sometimes have the, 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 the idea that Christianity is a comfortable religion. Christianity is anything but comfortable. This is not a cruise ship, this is a battleship. You may not know what tomorrow holds, but you know who holds tomorrow, don't you? Brothers and sisters, we got, we, we're going through some rough waters now in the church. We are, we're really losing folk by the hundreds and thousands because we have been told a lie. We've been sold a bad bill of goods because everything is for our comfort. You have people that will, will get upset with the least amount of things. They won't, they won't stand up for nothing. Well, go along with everything and then argue you about it. Well, I don't understand. You know, well, you, you know, well, that's them, and that's just how it goes. And listen, listen, I understand that's how it goes, but, but are you going to stand up if they ask you? Are you going to, oh, well, you know, that's just the world. That's the world. I understand that. But we are supposed to be salt in the world. We're supposed to be a light in the world. And salt changes things. Now, you want, you want, you want me not to come over your house to eat? Fix me some greens with no salt. Fix me some chicken with no seasoning. I just can't eat bland food. Anybody with me? I, I just, I don't like bland food. When salt gets into that thing, it's something about it, you know? I know it's bad for your blood pressure, but I know it's just something good about salt. Salt just make everything. Fit. Anybody have some french fries with no salt? And you're like, oh, man, no ketchup, no nothing. Salt is good. Yes, sir. Salt means to change, but also salt is used to keep things from decaying. Do you realize that two-thirds of the world's water is, is, is ocean? And all oceans are salt water? Can you imagine if something died and that salt wasn't there? It keeps it from decomposing and smelling. Salt changes. Now, salt can also irritate if you ever had an open sore and you take some salt like we used to do back in the day, ooh, pour that thing in there, ouch! It hurts, but it heals while it's hurting. We are salt, guys. We are salt. We are salt of the world. But then Jesus says, now, you can be salt, but lose your savor. Many of us have lost our savor. Brothers and sisters in the church, it's gotten so bad. Uh, I, I use the analogy, it's, it's like a frog in a pot of water. If you turn a pot of hot, a big old pot of water, like a gumbo pot, you know, big, big pots that you put in, you put a frog in a boiling pot of water, you know what it'll do? It'll jump right out. You know why? Because it's hot. Yeah. And then, and then especially it's hot. It feels the heat, it jumps right out. But what happens is, if you take that same frog, put it in some room temperature water, let it sit there for a while, put it on the stove, and turn it up ever so slowly, you know what'll happen? It'll get used to the water. It'll get comfortable in the water. And all of a sudden, that frog 
as you turn it up all the way, it'll boil to death. Because it can't recognize it's dying while it's in the same pot. Some of us are in a pot right now. And all Satan is doing is turning that thing up. And we don't even recognize we're dying in the church. We just come every Sunday and do the same thing, leave out here. But Satan is just turning that heat up real slow. Girl, you ain't got to come out that club. You might as well wear that mini skirt you, you wore last night. Take it on in the, sit down front, let everybody see you. Brothers, you bad too. Got the binoculars in, you know, you got the mirror, you know, the mirror on the shoes, you know. <laughs> Lusting after women. Women can't get to the party. Hey, sister, can I let you in? Come again. You <laughs> have a private Bible study. You know, you know. <laughs> Everybody's in this thing. Ain't nobody coming out. We all dirty. Brothers and sisters, I hope and I pray that when we look at our lives, when we take the the, the MRI, when we go through the machine, we can see on the surface we look good. But see, God doesn't look like man looks. He looks to the heart. He gets in that thing. He takes that blood pressure. And he sees, are you really faithful to me? Are you faking the funk? Are you really coming to church to be seen and not talked about? Are you coming because you want to be transformed? You want to be renewed? That's what God looks for. He looks for renewed people. You can sit in the back, you can sit in the front, and you can be the biggest devil, smile, sing the loudest, and go right to hell, right in the church. We got to be careful. We got to be careful. Look at what he says. In verse number, number, number five, he says, Paul is not there, but he gets the word that though there is encroaching false doctrine, they are still holding on to their faith. Verse six, and as they receive the teaching of the gospel, they received this previously. They are commanded to walk. See, they got to walk in the word. You can't just have the word. You got to walk in the word. What does that mean? Walking in the word means that my path is directed by God, not myself. We got too many self-directed Christians. The word of God directs my path. I don't get upset when I can't do certain things. You know why? Because God has already laid the path out. The victory is from here to there. All I got to do is stay on the track. You wonder why Paul uses running analogies and wrestling analogies so much? He says, you know, I press toward the mark. That's racing analogy. That's, that's Olympic game analogy. Because when you're running track, and I didn't run, I threw the shot put, but I used, used to watch the track runners. One of the things they had to do was keep their eye focused. I've seen guys on TV when they're running and they're in this big lead. And what they do is they go like this to see who's coming up on their left on their right. I think Brother Wilson can attest to this. That slows you down. And winning and losing can be a matter of one one thousandth of a second. If you want to win a race, the worst thing you can do is run a little behind you. Press toward the mark. You don't have to live that way you used to live. Press toward the mark. And when you run the race that the Lord has set before you, he says, listen, this is already a fixed fight. You already won. Now, now what you're going to have, you're going to have obstacles. You're going to have people that are going to try to trip you up. Satan is the master of that. He said, listen, man, hold on. It's like a giant chess match between him and God. He says, now, now Lord, you say he's, he's good. You say he's good. McKinney, he come to church. Yeah, I, I see that, but let me move over here. Let me... Let me, let me put this fine woman in and see what he do. Oh, he got past that. Okay, hold on, hold on. He got to go to work tomorrow. Let me see. I'm going to put this slow drive in this way. Oh, he got around that. Oh, okay. I, I got some form. I got some form. I know he like Billy D. Yeah, yeah. See, Colt 45. Oh, he, he didn't even touch that either. It's a chess match. Every day you wake up, it's you and the devil. It's you and the devil. You got to be renewed. That's why Paul says over there, in uh, 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 Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he says, uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word renew, it means renovation. So you got cobwebs in your, in your head right now. You got, you got sinful termites. And, and, and you got all these fornication spiders in your head and, 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 and lustful holes in your house. 
But when God comes in and he says, now I'm going to take the, 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 the floorboards out. I'm, I'm going to take that drywall out. I'm going to paint it up. I'm going to put some new, uh, new, new cabinets in here. I'm going to put some new appliances in here. I'm going to renew this thing. Yeah. See, it's still you. You're still the same person they remember back in 78, hanging with the boys, you know. Yeah, way back in the day. Some of y'all ain't even born in 78, you know. Yeah, you the same one you used to break their ass in the 80s. I know, that's you, that's you. Yeah, but you're a new person. You're the same person physically, but you're not mentally. You've been renewed. You've been renovated. See, that's, that's what God likes. God likes renovated Christians. Say amen when you can. Amen. Look, he says in verse 7, he says they ought to be rooted. I want you to underline the word rooted. That word rooted is very important. We talked about this last Sunday evening. We talked about the seeds and the various um, soil that the seed was, was put on. One of the soils was a seed that was dropped, but the root didn't take hold. You can be in the Lord's church Sunday in and Sunday out, hear the word of God, but if you don't have any root in yourself, when the winds blow, when the vicissitudes of life come, you're going to be shaken. You're going to be toppled over. Why? Because you don't have any root. If you don't have any root when problems come, brothers and sisters, you're going to, you're going to fail the test. You don't have any root. But also, I like when he uses another metaphor. Look at what he says. He says you should be built up. Now, these are our masonry imageries. And what he's saying is that you have to lay a foundation. You have to lay a firm foundation. Now, I don't know. I'm not a builder. But I, I've never seen a house built when the roofer comes first. Anybody seen that? The roofer gets there and says, are we ready to build? No, no, no. Not your time yet. You got to lay the foundation first. And then you got to make sure it's even and settled, right? I said this morning, you know, when I used to play football, when I first played, man, I was so, so awkward. I'd stand like this, get a three-point stance. And I, you know, get in three-point stance. Coach come to me and push me, push me right down. And then i get up and get in the stance again. He pushed me right back down again. And I, boy, you ain't got no stance. He said, shoulder whip, son. Bend your knees. He said, watch this. When he pushed me last time, I didn't move. See, I was firm. I had a stance. See, some of us are falling for everything. Yeah. I'm going with this today. Oh, that sounds good, too. I'm going with that tomorrow. We don't have a foundation. And if you don't have a firm foundation, you can get moved by anything or anybody. Problems on your job can move you. Problems at the house can move you. Anything can move you. And listen, brothers and sisters, you're going to get moved. Somebody's going to try you today. Some of y'all ain't going to be able to get out this church building before somebody try you. I'm just telling you like it is. I, I know. Church people, listen, I, I know. I know how it go. I know how it go. I remember the prayer for Moses. You know, Moses said, his father-in-law said, son, you, you can't handle all these, I mean, you can't handle all these people by yourself, you know, you know, and that's, you know, I mean, you can't, it's just people are just going to be people. So you got to learn that before I step out of this house, I'm going to say a prayer. Lord, bless me as I go to work. Lord, bless me as, as, I, as I try to run my family. Lord, bless me as I try to do things that please you. Because I know Satan is out there. He's going to test me today. But you can't have that unless you have the word of God in you. You've got to be rooted. You've got to have a stance. And then look at what he says. The stance and the rooting and the built up, brother, is in where? In Christ. See, some of us have it in Dr. Field. Some of us have it in Dr. Spock. Some of us have it in Oprah Winfrey. He says, no, no, no. The location is in Christ. Then he says, establish. That means you've got to prove what you believe. If it's not something that you can prove by the word of God, don't believe it. Don't believe it. See, brother, sisters, your faith can be mingled with a lie. And if you are believing a lie, it will send you to hell. That's the thing that's so scary. That's why I don't take chances with my soul. I don't take, listen, I love Brother Hayward to death. Love Billy Washington to death. But you know what I'm going to do when I get home? I'm going to be just like the, the saints. <laughs> you know, I'm going to study that thing. 
Because when I die, and I'm going to die, I'm going to stand before God. And, and Joe Osteen ain't going to be there. Uh, uh, T.D. Jakes ain't going to be there. You know, Creflo Dollar's not going to be there. You know, I, I definitely know Creflo Dollar ain't going to be there. But I'm just saying, I'm, I'm going to stand before God. I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to be judged by the things that were written therein. And if I don't have that right, then I'm going to be in trouble. That's why you got to stay rooted. Look at what he says. Stay established. Stay firm. But then in verse 8, he says, why? This is the caution. Beware. Lest any man spoil you. How does he spoil you? He leads you away. You're led captive by his lie. You're spoiled by what? Philosophy. Philosophia. The, the word literally means I like wisdom so much that I'm just going to give you what I think. And I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to make it work. See, see, asceticism and Gnosticism and even mysticism were, were, were they, they were a form of what they call theosophy, which, which is basically how does the world come to be? How, does, how do things work in the world? And so they were always reaching for something, but the answer was right here all the time. But they were saying like today, oh, that ain't good enough. You know, there was a Big Bang Theory. There were some gases that came together and then they exploded and, and the explosion brought all these amoebas together and then the amoeba started growing a tail and became a monkey and then the monkey became a human and then the human became... Yeah. I ain't never seen an explosion bring anything together. <laughs> never. Never. But then I asked the question, where did the gas come from? Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just admit, you, it's God. But some men are so smart and so enticing that they start pulling people away from the faith. That's why you got to be rooted, you got to be established, you got to be built up in the word of God. Because if you don't have the word of God in you, all you got left is, is false doctrine. That's all you got left. He says, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Then what else does he say? And vain deceit after the traditions of men. Now these were Jewish traditions. What they did was they had what was called the oral law, where they would speak what Moses gave them. They would pass it down. Uh, this, is, this is what the word tradition means. Paradidome. It just means to hand down from one generation to the other. But after they would hand it down, they would then add some stuff. You know, they would say, listen, make sure you wash your hands uh, before you eat. Uh, uh, you had 613 laws. You would have thought 613 laws is enough to remember by itself. That would have been enough for me. Two, I believe it was 248 uh, laws and, and 365 prohibitions. They had a prohibition for every day of the week. Don't do this. Don't do that. Watch this. Don't do that. Get stoned if you do that. You know, can't have due benevolence if your wife is uh, time of the month. You can't do all that. You know, all that stuff they had to do. But then the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes said, listen, now that's yeah, but we, we want to be, you know, we want to do better than that. Let's add some more laws to the law. And then they begin to love that law more than they love the word of God. This is what he means by being pulled away by traditions of men. And so what we have to do is stay focused on the word and not worry about the tradition. Brothers, you got to say two prayers before you have the preacher come up. You got to sing five songs. You, oh, you, they, oh, you did communion before you did giving. You know that's going to hell. Traditions of men. You start insulating the word of God with stuff that don't make no, no matter. No never mind, as we used to say. Why? Because that's traditions of men. Men have come up with that. Men have forced, it, forced fed that to us. But look, and then he, he gives us he gives us finally, as we, as we end this lesson, he gives us the conclusion of the matter. Verse 10. And ye are complete in him. In other words, you don't need nothing else but Jesus Christ. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Is that in your Bible? He says, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. He says this circumcision that we have is not the foreskin cutting away of the Old Testament. Paul alludes to that. He's not talking about the child must be circumcised eighth day. 
He's not dealing with that. He's saying the circumcision is the one that Jesus Christ does. Christ cuts away the old man. Christ reveals the new man. And circumcision was very important because it was, it was the, the, the region where we reproduce. So this is a reproduction. This is, this is something where we come, become new again in the circumcision. Now the question is, how, how we circumcise? Look at this in verse 12. He says we are what? Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who have raised him from the dead. The operation is not of us. We're not the ones that cause people to be saved. We're not the ones that put people in the church. It's Jesus Christ who circumcises us. It's Jesus the Christ who places us in the body of Christ. So don't say, well, I'm just baptizing your church. No, no, no. Christ does that. That's not our work. That's Jesus that does that. But you've got to be baptized into his body. Otherwise, you are not circumcised. You are still a slave. You, are, you haven't even been brought to the new community. You are still in darkness. The Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. People want to argue, well, I ain't got to get baptized. Well, it says one. Well, I've been baptized before. I was, I was in my holy oak. Well, there's only one. You got wet one time, but you didn't get baptized. There's only one. And then it says there's only one faith. Now, I know you can open your phone book and you can find 10,000 churches. But the Bible says it's only one. You know the thing about a counterfeit? A counterfeit is only a counterfeit because it looked like the real thing. If I gave this brother right here a counterfeit $100 bill, you know, he wouldn't be too happy. Because he tried to spend it. Lord help him. But it looked good. It looks good. But it's counterfeit. But the point is, there's only one. One Lord, one faith. One baptism. Now, if you want to argue about the faith part, you got to argue about the Lord part, too. Because he put that in there, too. You got one, one more than one faith, you got one, one, one more, more, more Lords. So you got to understand, brothers and sisters, what I'm getting at. The point is, you have to be in the body of Christ to be saved. And you cannot listen to every single person who even preaches in the body of Christ unless you confirm what they're saying. Faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Brother, how can I be saved today? I'm glad you asked. You can be saved today because you've already heard the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You go through the same process in a symbolic form, but for a real reason. When you hear the word of God, you believe it in your heart, you confess his name. You know what we do? We take you right here in the water right now. You get baptized. When you go down, the circumcision happens. Jesus cuts away that old man. Then he says, once you come out, now you leave that life of degradation and sin. You come over here. Come over here to the community of believers. You can do that. You can be saved right now. Or you can refuse to call. It's your choice. Or you can sit there in your seats. But remember this. To make no choice is but to make a choice. You can do it right now as we stand and sing Heaven's Invitation Song.